Welcome back to the Pro Bono Happy Hour. I'm Elise Dorita. Today's guest is Wendy Richards from Miller, Canfield, Paddock, and Stone. Wendy spoke to us from Detroit, Michigan, where she is based. We hope you enjoy our conversation. Hi, Wendy. Thank you for joining me today. Oh, hi, Elise. Thank you very much. So I'm going to just jump right in. Could you tell us what your early years were like and about your background? Uh, Sure. I am uh, from the Detroit area. I grew up in a suburb outside of Detroit. Uh, My parents uh, were both public school teachers. So I grew up in a very um, socially minded uh, family. They are um, what I call reformed hippies. (laughs) So uh, we had a lot of activities um, involving going out to um, help others in in nearby communities, being a part of the Detroit area. Obviously, there is um, a lot of um, issues relating to disparity of wealth and um, you know, struggles with poverty in many of the communities nearby. So we actually spent quite a bit of our time and energy um, visiting or doing what we could um, to help others. Um, The family was very uh, committed to being part of uh, a good momentum in the social fabric of this area. So that was an important, you know, value that I was raised with as a kid. That's great. So when and how did you decide to become a lawyer? I'm guessing that has something to do with it. Um, yeah, it's funny. I, I really don't have an exact moment when I decided to become a lawyer. Um, sometime during college, um, you know, you make that decision. I was a history major. And I actually thought it was fascinating how we all subscribe to these ideals and these principles that we hold to be so true. Um, And yet they're created by us. And I thought that concept was really interesting. And I actually really wanted to learn more about that in particular. Um, And particularly how the structure allows for and really depends upon dissent, but within certain parameters that we all hold to be true. So we all hold certain values and principles to be inviolate. But within that, we're supposed to be um, questioning authority. And I thought that was sort of a fascinating concept. I really wanted to learn more about it and how it actually worked. Um, and so that's really honestly why I decided to go to law school. And for your undergrad, you went to Michigan, right? I did. I did went to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. We're um, big Michigan fans here, so go blue. I couldn't have this podcast in Michigan and not say that. <laughs> Great. Um, Yeah, it's an excellent school. And obviously one where, again, sort of this idea of of dissent and mobilization is really fostered. And something I didn't realize as much, I just took as a given that that's what happens on a college campus. We'd always have um, great social activity on the Diag, which is an area in the middle of the campus. And it was just a normal part of our experience. And then I went to University of Virginia for law school and completely kind of different at that point. Um, so it was really interesting to see. I, I didn't realize I was sort of raised in that culture and um, until I actually was taken out of it. Um, but, yeah, University of Michigan is a great school. Um, wonderful to have the university nearby where I work right now in Detroit, too. And we have really close relationships with a lot of the law clinics and professors at the law school there right now. So what in your background or personality sparked a passion for pro bono and access to justice? I'm not really sure. I mean, I'm assuming it probably goes back to what I was saying about being raised by people that social activism and and having a social purpose was really important. Um, There's something to be said for having, you know, the tools to be able to help people um, who are, you know, sometimes voiceless or sometimes lack that access. And I really was driven to use the tools that I've been given um, to be able to help those who don't have them. And I think, again, coming from, you know, two public school teachers as parents um, to being from, you know, from the time I can remember being taught that that is the way that, 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 a good person, <laughs> um, you know, goes about their life. I think that that was something that was almost is almost a given. I don't think I've ever felt otherwise. Um, so I'm not sure there's an exact moment when it was sparked. Um, it's just something that I think has always been a part of of how 
I view the world, and I'm sure because of the way my parents had raised me. Um, but I think also growing up in an area like Detroit and outside Metro Detroit, when you do see such um, disparities um, and groups treated so differently, it's it's really, really apparent that there are um, injustices that really need to be addressed um, in order to live in, you know, the society that we think we do, right? So I, I don't know how um, you can escape, you know, driving through certain areas around here and seeing such stark um, differences and not feeling some sort of, uh, some sort of um, desire to make that change. Um, so I think that's also a big part. Um, and I did grow up um, in an area called Gross Point, which is an immediate suburb to Detroit, and there is probably one of the starkest divides in the nation between Gross Point and Detroit, particularly that, that particular neighborhood, in terms of wealth, at one point race, um, although that's that's slowly changing, but um, certainly wealth disparity, um, and to see that you know a child born on one side of that divide could have every opportunity in the world to succeed, and a child born just on the other side of the street um, had to deal with so many more obstacles in order to just be able to, you know, get to school, um, have a decent education, um, and have a chance um, at success. And so having that constantly be um, something that you, you, you witness and experience, there's no way you can really pretend that it's not happening. Um, and I think, again, talking, you know, about my parents, my, my mom spent a lot of time um, working with um, schools and children in Detroit, um, you know, trying to create libraries, trying to create tutoring opportunities. And I was a part of that. She made sure that I was brought in with her. Um, and so, again, I think that that was something that you just know um, isn't right. Um, this disparity isn't, isn't helpful, isn't, um, isn't the way that we want to be, and what can we do about it? And my mom's a teacher. That was what she had to offer. Um, as a lawyer, this is what I have to offer in order to help sort of stop, stop that sort of justice. So. Definitely. So how did you get to Miller, Canfield, Paddock, and Stone? Sure. Um, so I... I mentioned that I was at the University of Virginia for law school. Um, after I graduated from law school, I actually went out to Palo Alto and worked for Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett in their um, relatively recently opened Palo Alto office then. Um, and while we were there, my husband is in grad school. He finished, and we were deciding whether we wanted to stay or come back home. And I've always been really passionate about the city of Detroit um, in general in this region and wanting to come back and do something. And um, we decided, you know, why don't we try looking in Detroit for jobs? So I interviewed um, at Miller Canfield and was really impressed with their um, commitment to this community. So Miller Canfield's the oldest law firm in Michigan, deep, deep, deep roots in the city of Detroit. And it's also, um, a firm that has a really strong public law department. So the the firm really considers itself to be um, a, a strong component of this area. Um, they're committed to you know good government and committed to the success of this region. And I found that really attractive. And at the time, the CEO um, who was in charge of the firm at the time was also a really strong proponent of the city of Detroit and uh, pro bono generally. And I also found that attractive as well. So I, I ended up taking a job here um, and left Palo Alto to, to come to Miller Canfield. I was here for about nine years as a commercial litigator and then decided to um, take some time to work for a nonprofit. Uh, the nonprofit focused on community economic development, which is a passion of mine, in underserved communities, mainly in the city, um, but throughout Michigan. And the job also uh, focused on transactional pro bono opportunities, which is something I'd never done before, but really wanted to be a part of. Um, so I ended up leaving Miller Canfield uh, and working for that nonprofit for a while. I ran their pro bono, um, their legal and policy programs, 
and then ended up eventually becoming general counsel for the nonprofit, and I was there for three years. And that was a wonderful opportunity. I'm happy to talk about that some more. But the current CEO of our firm, um, Mike McGee, uh, asked me out to lunch and said, I've been hearing a lot about pro bono counsel as a role, and we are really interested in it in whether you would be interested willing to take that on um, at the firm. And if you were, what would that look like? And why don't you send me a proposal? And so I put together a proposal as to what I thought a pro bono counsel should be, um, how they should integrate within the firm in various ways, you know, both professional development, business development, as well as obviously the, the pro bono, strictly pro bono aspect of it. And um, from my observations on the other side, working for a nonprofit that handled transactional pro bono, and working through a national network of similar organizations, kind of seeing what worked and what didn't at other firms. And so I put together a proposal and um, didn't hear for a few months. I assumed that they decided not to not to take it on. And then he called me, I think it was in August of 2016, and asked if I wanted to come back to the firm and take on their role. So I did. Um, and it's been absolutely wonderful. I still um, love the nonprofit where I worked before, and we're very close with them. We work um, on several projects with them, and uh, really, really, they're great partners. But I was excited to have this opportunity to come back to a firm that I loved and that was aligned with my values and supported this role so um, completely that it's been it's been great. So we're going to talk a little bit about your role in a bit, but um, you mentioned Miller Canfield was, the, I think, the oldest firm in Detroit. Could you tell us a little bit more about the firm? Sure, uh, absolutely. As I mentioned, um, obviously the oldest firm in Detroit and in Michigan, I believe. And I want to say we're one of the older law firms in the country. So we've been around for quite a while. Um, But we are focused in mainly in the Midwest. We have several offices in the state of Michigan. But we also have a strong and kind of unique international presence. So we have affiliate offices in Windsor, Canada. Um, Ontario, Canada, and uh, Mexico, but we also have three offices in Poland um, and an office in Shanghai. So that's definitely a unique (laughs) attribute of the firm. Uh, We have a really strong um, presence in the public law arena, as well as litigation, employment law, uh, real estate. So we are a full-service firm, but there are certain areas where we're really, really well-known, and those areas are the ones I just mentioned. Um, we have about, I want to say around, let's say 220 attorneys or so. Uh, the bulk of us are in Detroit, but we are, we are all over. So now I'm going to pivot back to your role that we just kind of touched on as a leader of the firm's pro bono practice team. How do you spend your time? Like, what is your role and is there anything you can be doing more of or less of? Sure. And I have a somewhat unique role in the pro bono counsel area. So I have basically 70% pro bono, 30% billable. So obviously a chunk of my day is devoted to billable work. As far as the pro bono work, most of it is, most of my day really is encouraging others to do pro bono and trying to figure out what their passions are. So I take this role on a kind of personal level where I really like to know my attorneys very well really get a sense for what's going to um, give them satisfaction in their job and really motivate them to do the best they can in pro bono. Um, and so I do a lot of you know going to th- through the offices, talking to the attorneys, figuring out what they like both from a practice standpoint and from a personal standpoint, um, whether they're feeling frustrated about something, whether they want to, um, you know, fulfill some sort of, you know, personal passion, um, if they are um, looking to uh, kind of hone some of their skills, if they want to work with certain people, trying to partner them with other attorneys as mentors. Um, and I, I try to take it on a very individual basis and then look for a project that fits that person. And a firm our size, like I said, we have around, you know, let's say around 220 or so, I can do that. I know in some of the bigger firms it's a little bit harder, but I really spend a lot of my time trying to individualize the pro bono opportunities for our attorneys. Um, I also try to make sure that we 
work with our partners externally. So when I took this role, it was in October 2016. And, um, you know, obviously with a change in administration, you're going to see changes in needs um, because there will be policy changes, right? So when the election happened, uh, I reached out to my, you know, my cohort locally. We have a, a handful of pro bono counsel and pro bono coordinators in Detroit to figure out what, what they were doing, what, what areas their firms focus on pro bono. I reached out to the um, nonprofit community um, and the legal aid community to figure out areas where they saw um, where the needs may change and where they may increase. And then with um, even with the state bar and the pro bono initiative, you know, run by the state bar that we have here, and then nationally through APCO, I, I you know, attended listening sessions on that too, um, to really try to understand where as a firm um, we could best fit in, like where we could spend our time to provide the greatest value and impact for the communities that we serve on a pro bono basis. And thinking also where we wouldn't be duplicating efforts, um, where we could work in partnership with others, um, where there are other firms that had stronger presence in certain types of areas, so we could partner with them. And in areas where I knew that our firm had a strong, we had a strong roots and uh, kind of a, a group of attorneys who'd be able to provide um, service because they'd been working in that area for a while. And so from that, we had determined that our firm would focus on four key areas for pro bono. So we focus on immigrants' rights and immigration, voting rights, uh, prisoners' rights, um, and criminal justice, as well as community economic development. We do other projects as well. We do other work beyond that, of course. I mean, you know, expungements or driver's license restoration, um, you know, even, you know, various areas that we will work in other than those. But with those others, I tend to partner with other firms that I believe are leaders in our community in those particular areas to find opportunities because I know they have they have um, their finger on the pulse in those areas. But for these four, I wanted to make sure that we were focusing our energies. And so to the extent I can um, work with our partners externally to find opportunities where we would be of value in those four key areas, that's a big part of my my day too. And I, that's a constantly evolving process. Obviously things change so frequently and so um, sometimes without any notice that I try to make sure that we kind of stay on those um, topics and that takes some time. And then working within those, trying to find opportunities where we can um, intersect with our, with our talent here um, on the attorney side. And then again, of course, knowing where our attorneys are looking for opportunities to further their own careers or, or um, their passions how I can make those work together. That's a big part of my day, actually. Um, beyond that, um, you know, making sure that I'm trying to be out of the firm, I'm trying to make sure that I understand what's going on externally to know if this is the wrong place for us, if we should be thinking about other ways where we could be providing greater value for our, our, the populations in need that we could serve. So I do spend a lot of time talking to our partners. Um, trying my best to work with the national networks as well because they sometimes um, have new ideas or sometimes get information before I do, just given the markets, um, but to think about ways I can integrate those opportunities with um, the lawyers in our firm. That's a big part of my day. Um, I also, because I look at this role as pro bono counsel as being sort of multifaceted, particularly in a firm like ours, which is smaller, um, and the AMLA 200, you know, a big part of my job is business development as well as professional development. So I try to work with our marketing and our professional development um, leaders as well as the firm leadership um, to understand from their perspective where they want to go and how we can integrate pro bono into their strategies as well. Um, and so to the extent there are industries that they're looking to target, if there are clients that we'd want to strengthen or build relationships with, um, if there are skills that we think are lacking in our attorneys um, or maybe skills that we'd like to encourage um, greater momentum or that type of thing, how I can find ways to integrate pro bono into those uh, objectives. And that's also obviously, you know, pretty time consuming part of my day, but I, I do love it. And I think of, of pro bono, if we want to continue um, with recognizing the importance of pro bono, I have to also understand <laughs> that this is, this is part of the strength and fabric of the firm on, as a whole. 
And so um, looking at as me being a partner, um, even for those people who may not necessarily have known pro bono well before, having to do some education um, or or kind of sort of an iterative process with them to understand that I am their partner too. And and that's that's actually been um, – I feel like we're in a place that that's not – that's a given at this point for sure. But, you know, obviously having a new role as pro bono counsel and not having that before, there's a little bit of that, you know, catching up. But I do think that, that the firm fully understands and, and the attorneys here fully understand that pro bono is, is sort of hand in glove with, um, with the success of the firm in general. So um, that takes up a big part of my day on top of the, of course, the billable work. Um, and, and that's always, that's always an important part as well. So is there anything you wish you could be doing more or less of or anything you found a challenge? Um, let me think. So I, I, I think with anything, I'm, I'm sort of fascinated by legal ops in general <laughs> and, and how law firms in this industry can be more efficient on the whole. Um, and you're looking at, you know, this is just a sea change right now and how law firms um, really tackle their work. And I, I really would like to see that same initiative um, related to like efficiencies and process um, improvements, even in the pro bono world. And so to the extent we can utilize technology or utilize some sort of shared process and, and goals to minimize the admin burden, um, I think is fantastic. And, and taking that one step further, thinking about how we can also take that same drive and apply it to, you know, the access to justice um, arena. And I know that that's already going on, but to the extent that as a firm, we can also be a part of it where we can really um, scale up some of this work um, in a way where when we have repetitive um, tasks, we can make it so much easier um, for the attorneys uh, to be able to serve more people. Um, So that to me is something that I want you know, looking forward is something I want to focus on more and more um, and kind of exploring new technologies and new ways that we can make that um, make that happen. So that's something I think, you know, no one no one really likes to deal with the admin burden, of course, and, and to think that we can utilize these tools. I think that's excellent. So that's something I want to look at going forward. Um, I don't know in terms of challenges. I mean, the one thing is. I don't look at it as a challenge. I actually look at it, I mean, a challenge in an exciting way and in a fun way of, of, of explaining to those who may not understand pro bono again or may not really recognize how um, important it is um, to really convert them. <laughs> I don't know. So that to me is, is, is a fun challenge. I mean, to really, to really have someone have that aha moment when they take on a pro bono matter and they really have that sort of deep visceral personal connection um, in a positive way um, with a client that they'd never experienced or hadn't in a while and reminds them of, you know, why you went to law school or reminds you, reminds them of (laughs) their sort of more human side, why we do this work and why we're here um, and they become converts. And so that to me is a challenge, but in, in the best possible sense. And so not that I would like to do less of it, I'd like to do more of it. But of course, I'd rather, you know, you're obviously in a better position when everyone is already on board. But but those who were not believers in pro bono who then become believers in pro bono, that's one of the most exciting, I guess, challenges of the job. Um, so actually, I do like it. So. so that is a great segue into my next, next question. You mentioned you spend uh, part of your day motivating people. What have you found is the best way to incentivize lawyers at the firm to do pro bono? Well, we know we did some policy changes when when I came in. So we did change our policy um, to allow for automatic 100 hours of pro bono to count towards billable in any evaluation year. And we have instituted a policy for uh, non-principals where that 100 hours is, is sort of hidden in their reporting. So, you know, there was some some thought from the um, non-principals at one point, like, well, yes, you can say that, but somehow people are going to find out and they'll be dinged for it. And that's not the case. I mean, it really is rolled into their evaluation. So unless someone really were to spend a lot of time trying to figure it out, all they see is that being as part of their um, billable. 
Um, and I do think that changes quite a bit, obviously, um, whether someone will be willing to take a pro bono project, you know, having it kind of billable as one incentive. Um, but to be perfectly honest, I find that that's not really what motivates people. I mean, it helps. It's one thing that certainly is, is useful. But I think the most important thing is really <laughs> figuring out what the, what drives that person, um, what is going to make them satisfied and happy, and and understanding, you know, sometimes that's just getting in court. I mean, I have people who want to do pro bono because they know they can get in court, and that's what's going to motivate them. They'll work 300 hours because they they really want to be, you know, arguing. They want a trial. They, you know, they want to be in court, and that's what motivates them. Others are really, you know, passionate about a certain issue, um, and they will spend hundreds of hours working on that because it is their deep belief. And that can go from, you know, animal rights to immigrants' rights to, again, voting rights. It doesn't matter. Whatever that passion is, that's what's going to drive them. Um, and then others have, you know, others are motivated by guilt and duty, <laughs> the feeling of obligation. Um, and so trying to figure out how I can, you know, help them with that. Like I know I'm supposed to be doing 30 hours under the state bar pro bono standards. So what can I do to meet those numbers um, and helping them there? So I found it's, it's kind of like children. I mean, in some ways you, it's not the stick, it's the carrot, right? And so what is, what is it? that I can do to support you rather than push you and getting to those goals. And uh, what I have found is once a person, you know, gets bitten by the bug, it's almost, I mean, I sometimes have to tell people that they can't take so much pro bono, <laughs> particularly with the new attorneys, because I'm like, okay, got to balance a little bit. But, but once you get bitten, they, they love it. They love it. Cause there really is no greater, I think rush at, for a human being to be able to help someone else and to be able to use these special tools that we have and these special skills that we have and really lawyers have, you know, a monopoly on these skills, um, how we can use that to really help someone who needs it so much. And I think once someone gets that bug, they, they don't stop. Um, so I, I don't know. There's a lot of, um, aligning the work with individual passion and making sure that there is that human connection at some point, because that is really, there's nothing better. Um, and that's been really successful um, here at the firm. But again, I know that I'm in a unique position in the MLA 200, given, you know, we are a little bit on the smaller side to be able to, to do that. But that's been honestly my, my, my best tool. <laughs> so that's it. So I'm going to circle back to Detroit. Could you tell sure. us a bit about the access to justice and pro bono community in Detroit? Because in some ways, the city's experienced a renaissance. How has the community and their legal needs kind of changed over time? <sighs> well, it's interesting. And so I would say the, it's experienced a renaissance in, in a sense. And this goes back to what I was describing before. You know, I worked in community economic development for three years. And so what has been wonderful is that there is positive momentum in many areas, in particular the neighborhoods, um, where community organizations have really driven some wonderful improvements um, in their communities. I mean, they're the best, obviously, the best suited and best to be able to serve um, their own communities in a way that would um, meet the needs and, and move them forward. And the recognition, I believe, from law firms and other, you know, foundations and other stakeholders in this area to understand that that is how, how progress has to be driven in the neighborhoods of Detroit. I do think that that's, that's fully embraced and recognized. And I think the one thing that's been great in some ways is Detroit has been behind other areas that have gone through some sort of renaissance or, or whatever you want to call it. And that we've seen the mistakes that other communities have made um, in that desire to sort of encourage economic development at all costs um, and not paying attention to the communities that have been there and the communities that live there. Um, I do think that we are very conscious here in Detroit of not replicating those mistakes and pushing against those forces in a way that we can work in partnership with economic development. I mean, everyone here understands that we need to – improve the tax base. We need to improve the quality of life in many of the um, communities. Um, it's unacceptable in some ways of what has been going on around here and, and, and 
human beings should not be treated <laughs> and disregarded in the ways that they have been in the communities in Detroit in many ways. But but that this has to be something where the fabric of the community that already is there is a part of this equation. And so I do think that that's where Detroit is unique and exciting and a model for other cities. Um, and I think that we all understand that. Those of us in this world understand that. So I think though, so, with that said, there is still so much to do. Um, now, you see a lot of the stories of the Renaissance of Detroit are focused on the developments that are happening in what we call the downtown and midtown areas or, um, you know, university neighborhoods where um, there are areas that are, they're great. They're doing phenomenally well. I mean, in comparison, for sure, um, exciting, but they're not the neighborhoods. Um, and so to say, you know, that everything's hunky dory is definitely not the case. I mean, there's a lot going on in the neighborhoods that that isn't. The, 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 I want to say that they're ignored. That's wrong. But there's a lot more work that needs to be done, and there's a lot more we need to do to encourage um, equity and inclusion and uh, a more equitable re renaissance, if you will, in in areas outside of the core. And so that work continues. Um, but I do have faith that in particular in Detroit, given the bankruptcy that we went through and the partnership that the city of Detroit had had with foundations, um, we rec recognize like the importance of philanthropy in this work um, and the importance of, you know, public private partnerships as well. And I think that we, the foundations have definitely gotten behind the idea that this is something that can't be done, you know, parachuting in and, um, you know, a big development. And so that work is supported, I think, in this area um, much differently than you'd see in other cities and, and, and accepted by leaders in ways that may not be the same as you'd see in other cities as well. Um, so I think that's actually really exciting about Detroit. Um, and just, you know, in terms of if, if you want to see, you know, encouragement and integration of the arts, um, support of small businesses and entrepreneurs in underserved communities, um, urban, urban agriculture and land use, um, and really creative and innovative and, you know, I say grassroots, but grassroots ways. I mean, this is the place to be. I mean, it is just wonderful um, because it's really driven by, in, from, the, from the right places. Um, in terms of access to justice, I mean, we have, crippling poverty in the city and in areas around the city and areas like Flint and, and Benton Harbor and even Pontiac and, and, and areas in Michigan that are, 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 are the, the areas that really, really still need a lot of, of assistance and help um, from the legal community. And, and one thing, I mean, because the needs are so incredibly overwhelming, um, one thing that I think the state, should and, and, and is trying to do is really thinking about, you know, really broader policy changes to make access to justice, um, again, more equitable. Um, there's only so much the legal, pro bono legal community can do, and we try. But really, these are systemic changes that need to happen. And I know that a lot of us on this side, on the access to justice, the pro bono side, are working to try to think about ways that we can streamline and make um, the processes smoother for those who in need. Um, and so it's using pro bono, but on a scale much grander than the individual case. Um, and, and that's where I really think the change is going to happen in, around here because, again, the needs are so enormous. Um, and there's only so much that pro bono can do. And so I'd like to see really more momentum there. It's already started. There's definitely initiatives going on, you know, both at the state bar level and, and elsewhere that are moving towards that. But um, you know, we have a we have a really a, a new administration coming in um, in you know January. Um, we have some you know who knows what that will bring, but hopefully that'll also bring some you know further momentum and continuance of of this of this path. Um, I think also what we're seeing is in in the giving levels um, for some reason, and I don't know why, but Michigan 
is ranked, you know, 44th in, in giving for, for legal aid in the country um, based on certain formulas. I'm sure, you know, you can slice and dice those numbers differently, but, but generally accepted 44th in the country. And yet we are, we're not 44th in the country in terms of, you know, generally how, how where our, our lawyers stand income wise and, and the needs are so enormous here. And so we are going through um, a reorganization um, at the Michigan State Bar Foundation level. Um, they are really changing um, how they're going through their giving campaigns, and they've now moved to a centralized statewide campaign. Um, and uh, they are really pushing for in-house counsel to support with the hopes that law firms also jump on board, of course, um, and broadening the reach and making it easier for people to donate um, and to give to one source. Because before we had you know, so many different organizations competing against the same dollars. And, of course, they're strapped as well. Um, they don't have – they can't spend their time, you know, raising funds that they should be giving, you know, spending that time, obviously, delivering services. So the State Bar is taking that on. State Bar Foundation is taking a lot of that work on now. And so the hope is that this new centralized campaign where people can give to the State Bar, which then distributes the money based on formulas of, um, of populations in need and, and some other criteria, that that will actually help increase giving. And I, and I really hope that it's successful because this is a place where we really, really, really need it. And I'd like to see um, other firms that may not have been as um, prominent in the giving um, in the past look to this new model as a way to really sort of help get those um, scales back in balance because um, it's, 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 it's pretty devastating. So I am going to shift focus a little on work you've done. So You've done an extensive range of immigration work, which you mentioned um, is a focus of the firm, from assisting detained travelers at the Detroit airport when the travel ban was implemented to re representing Iraqi nationals belonging to religious and ethnic minorities that are in danger of deportation. Could you share more about this work? Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I think right currently the biggest immigration matter that we have, um, certainly the most prominent is um, the Hamama versus Aducci class action. So in 2017, the um, in June of 2017, there was uh, a, a roundup of um, hundreds of Iraqi nationals um, who were then put in detention and told that they were going to be put on planes and sent back to Iraq. And the reason why this was so um, unusual is that for many, many years, the government of Iraq had refused to take back most um, most um, Iraqi nationals who were to be deported. Uh, this goes back to the Saddam Hussein years. This was the policies that they really, with very few exceptions, would take back um, Iraqi nationals who were going to be um, deported from the U.S. And so instead, uh, those nationals would then um, operate under orders of supervision and check in with ICE um, regularly. Um, and this was going on for years and years. And so many of them had been in this country since they were small children. Um, they had been refugees themselves. Some had committed minor crimes, some not minor crimes. Some had some sort of immigration violations. But for whatever reason, they had been, you know, ordered to be removed, but they were remaining in this country under orders of supervision. Some of them had been under orders of supervision for decades. So um, they had, you know, started families. They had opened businesses. They had been paying taxes. They had been following the laws and were many times really, really, really beneficial members of our society, you know, from an objective standpoint. I mean, these were people who were part of our community for years and years and years. And then almost out of nowhere, in June of 2017, they were rounded up. And in Michigan, there's actually a strong um, and large population of Chaldeans, um, which are um, Christian population from Iraq, um, persecuted. Um, quite frankly, there was a genocide in Iraq recently where huge villages basically gone. Um, and a lot of the Chaldean population in the metro Detroit area, they're very active. Um, and many of these individuals were then rounded up. And so we got a call um, to help what at that point was a TRO. Help with the TRO to see if we could 
stay the deportations just to, you know, to allow those who are detained the opportunity to get to immigration court and let, you know, show that the changed country conditions in Iraq for this community was so great that, that to send them back would be in violation of, 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 of the law. Um, that they would be facing such extreme persecution, potential for torture, or even death, that this is, this is unconscionable. It could not happen. Um, and they just needed the opportunity to be able to do that. And remember, because they had been operating before under orders of supervision, they didn't have to go through those steps in the past because they were allowed to live here anyway. But now that, again, out of, without warning, basically taken, they had to be able to show that, that they could not go back. And that was what our objective was. And that was a TRO. And it was granted. So that was great. Um, and then um, we found that it's not just Detroit, obviously. It's, it's around the country this is going on. So we went to the court and asked to expand this uh, nationwide. We had a preliminary injunction and then expand that nationwide, and which was granted. So nationwide, there was a stay to allow the class members, at that point putative class members, but now class members, the opportunity to be able to go to the immigration court and argue that the change country conditions were such that they would be they would be under extreme danger if they were sent back. Um, in the process, we were able to work with partners. Um, we, as a firm, don't handle immigration, the individual's immigration cases, but some of our partners were able to put together a network to um, find pro bono volunteers at firms around the country um, to help those individuals in their immigration cases and immigration court. And that was just in and of itself, again, not our firm, but amazing the work that happened there um, to be able to mobilize people to help in the end, you know, close to 300 people, if not more in the class that would have been detained, um, you know, at least have the opportunity to find pro bono counsel. They may have said, no, they didn't want it, but, but they at least had the opportunity to find pro bono counsel in, in detention centers around the country. And it was really amazing. Um, our firm was working on the class action. So um, we had the stay of deportation. We brought a motion for class certification, which was granted. Um, one of my colleagues, Kimberly Scott, um, was named as one of the class counsel, along with Margot Schlanger, who's a professor at University of Michigan. Um, and since then, I believe um, there have been a couple other attorneys, certainly Miriam Ackerman, and I believe a couple others also, too, who were also named as class counsel. But um, we took over that work um, and then brought a motion for preliminary injunction in order to allow those who had been detained the opportunity to be released on bond if they could, if, you know, to be able to have at least that opportunity to be released on bond. They shouldn't be detained um, while this is going on. And um, we were successful in that as well. Um, they have the government would have to show that they were a danger of flight risk if they had been in detention for a certain amount of time um, and could be released on bond if, if, or, or on their own recognizance if they were not, either of those. So that actually, I mean, quite frankly, the stay is enormous, obviously, but you could imagine the emotional toll that happens. An individual has been kept in detention for more than six months away from their families and away from their jobs. Um, and that feeling that there's no hope in sight and to be able to get that relief was enormous. Um, we are now, we have brought a renewed um, motion um, on what we call the Zed Vitus claim. So a renewed motion to not allow those who remain in detention um, to be kept there because we are arguing that it has now come to the point that it's indefinite detention. We had found um, some evidence to show that the government of Iraq actually isn't willing to take back people en masse. As we had originally been, as originally been told to the court, um, and we have raised this with the court. We've briefed it in the court. We've argued in front of the court that that is not the case, um, and that um, under Supreme Court precedent, um, that they cannot be remaining in detention indefinitely if there isn't, you know, evidence that the government would be able to would be accepting them if they want to go back. Um, the government of Iraq. Um, Traditionally, and you know, in the papers that we've discovered, um, does, did not want to take people back if, against their will, um, if they were afraid that they were going to be um, in danger. Um, of course, there are some exceptions to that, but that's on an individual basis, and um, if it can't be shown that they could be um, um, that there is some sort of you know significant likelihood of removal in the foreseeable future, then they should not remain in detention. That's remaining um, that that. 
that motion is, is pending in front of the court at the moment. So we will find out shortly, but that would be affecting the remaining 100 or so um, nationals who are in detention. Um, of course, there are always exceptions, you know, of your national security risk and others. I mean, you wouldn't be released, but but to the extent that you're, own, you're being held um, under this assumption that there's a likelihood you'll be um, removed in the reasonably foreseeable future, and there's not um, a likelihood, then, then therefore they should be released. So um, that's now pending. And that's been a case where it's been an incredible experience because we've worked with such a broad um, range of partners on that. Um, as I mentioned, we're working with Margot Schlanger, a professor at University of Michigan Law School, um, also with ACLU of Michigan, and Miriam Ackerman's leading that, um, who's just an amazing, amazing person. It's been wonderful to work with her and a brilliant writer, um, as well as the ACLU Immigrants' Rights Project out of New York City. Um, interestingly, we're working with two attorneys, um, Lee Alert and Judy Rabinitz, who um, were two attorneys that I worked for when I was in law school. <laughs> so I had an internship with them um, as a summer, you know, for for the summer. And, and 20 years later, we're, I'm working with them again, which is, is kind of interesting. Um, and um, and some other local partners, Michigan Immigrant Rights um, Center, um, as well as Code Legal, which is um, was been was really helpful in the initial days, in particular of um, reaching out to the families of those who were detained and getting a sense of what was going on because it was a little bit, you can imagine, like an emergency situation. And they had deep roots in the Keltian community in particular and being able to access um, their networks and understand what was happening on the ground was was critical. And so the teamwork that involved in this project has just been um, really, um, I would say eye-opening, but really um, rewarding. And the work product, I think, that comes out of it because of so many different perspectives coming together um, has been phenomenal. So I would say that's been the highlight of my legal career so far as being a part of that case, um, and in particular because we have been able to be um, to provide success for those class members who who have been you know able to get relief in the immigration courts or at least get their um, cases in process to be you know through the process to be heard, um, as well as those class members who have been released, and hopefully those remaining class members who will be released. Um, so, so that's been, um, been amazing. That's some amazing collaborative work, and we can't wait to hear what happens uh, with the pending part of the case. So recently we had leaders from the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law on the podcast to talk about election production in advance of the midterms. You're also very involved in this work by helping create a poll workers guide and co-chairing APCO's Voting Rights Task Force. So how did these experiences influence how you spent your election day this year? Uh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, we were really lucky to be able to work with the Lawyers Committee and um, Brennan Center as well on the poll worker project. Um, and we could talk a little bit about that. Um, that was a collaboration um, between about a dozen law firms around the country to create uh, poll worker guides with the intent of encouraging uh, lawyers and law students to become poll workers. Because in Brennan Center and Lawyers Committee's research, one of the biggest obstacles to the, to the right to vote in some ways is, is at the poll worker level. I mean, you really need to have qualified poll workers who are able to stand up to um, those who are trying to suppress, um, to be able to understand the rules really well, um, be adept at technology, um, be able to troubleshoot um, in ways that make the process very easy and smooth for everyone involved. Um, and that sort of um, that voter-centric approach to the, the poll worker community was something that we wanted to encourage. And we thought that lawyers and even law students in particular would be great candidates for that. And so with that coalition, we put together uh, materials to really to really explain how to do it, why you would want to do it, and some of the key issues that you'd be thinking about. Now, there's great training in every state, you know, as to, to what you need to do if you're a poll worker, of course. But this was to give, you know, a kind of an understanding of 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 some of the some of the issues that you'd be facing. And um, we had, I believe, we've uh, released about 14 of those so far. Um, the rest um, are in process, um, and we're hoping to be rolling those out. 
um, obviously, certainly before 2020, but on an ongoing basis, you know, after the election. That took up a lot of time, obviously, but, but we'll be rolling those out right um, after. And um, we also actually ended up working with um, Lawyers for Good Government, who was nice enough to um, promote these products with their great network, um, because, again, that's a target audience for us, is to find volunteers in their network who'd want to be able to volunteer for the poll workers, uh, to be a poll worker. So um, that's a continuing process, and again, we'll we'll be rolling that out, you know, for the, over the next two years, um, as well as um, trying to track some of the data as to who is accessing the guides, who decided to become a poll worker because they saw the guides, and figure out those communities where um, poll workers are needed more. Um, and so this is going to be really exciting, and I think a great place to be watching um, for the next couple of years. Um, through that work, though, and I wasn't familiar, actually, with election protection, um, and I'm embarrassed to say that I, mean, I knew about the party challengers quite a bit, um, and I was familiar with the work um, on that end, um, but since I stepped back into this role as pro bono counsel and working so closely with um, Lawyers Committee, I really have a much better sense, obviously, of the election protection um, work that happens you know, around the country. Um, our firm um, decided that our best use um, of time, I guess, the best, most value that we could provide um, would be actually being field workers. And so we recruited a team of attorneys. We had 12 attorneys um, dispersed throughout the state, so actually quite a few in the Grand Rapids and West Michigan area. We had some in the Ypsilanti, um, Ann Arbor area, as well as Detroit Metro. Um, as field workers working with election protection and the lawyers committee. And I have to say, I think every one of us found the experience incredibly rewarding, um, being able to help um, the poll workers um, when they wanted us to, being able to, um, you know, obviously call in issues that we saw and, and being good in really partnership to allow those who have the right to vote to be able to, to vote. Um, it was a wonderful experience, and we're really, really looking forward to doing that again in 2020. And I know in 2020 we'll have even probably you know three times as many people, I'm sure, volunteer. But this first batch, I say, you know, with 12 of the firm our size is great, and we were really excited to be a part of it. Um, and I was thrilled to be able to help Lawyers Committee. It's great. So uh, we recently launched a relatively new segment on the podcast called Tell Us About Your First Time. Could you tell us about – uh, your first or one of the early pro bono matters that you've handled? Uh, sure. So I, earlier I said that I worked for Simpson Thatcher and Bartlett in Palo Alto, um, which actually is a great office for pro bono in general and really supportive of pro bono work. And it was an, a, a wonderful place to cut my teeth <laughs> and practicing the law with a community of attorneys that really encourage pro bono work. Um, one of the most memorable early cases that I had was uh, a Ninth Circuit appeal. Um, we had represented a woman who um, had uh, was a cutter. She didn't she cut herself, um, but was not suicidal, not dangerous, a wonderful mother. Um, but her child was taken from her, and um, we were representing her in the Ninth Circuit actually um, to try to get her child to allow her to be reunited with her child. And um, in the between the interim between filing the papers and the hearing, um, they actually were reunited, which was wonderful. The case was moot at that point, but the court allowed us to argue anyway, um, which was really nice, um, even though we knew we won. <laughs> um, so, um, so it was a wonderful opportunity, and and to be able to get in front of the Ninth Circuit, I think it was maybe a first or second year attorney, and argue this, and it, it you know essentially at that point was somewhat of a moot court exercise. Um, but they were they were so gracious and wonderful, and you know told everyone in the courtroom, you know, to. How, how nice it was that we took on this case for photo and and that was it was a it was a great experience um so that was probably um one of the first times um I could see the power of pro bono like I knew why we would do it you know why someone should do it but really could see wow I mean I could get in front of the ninth circuit as a first or second year and argue um I mean that would never happen probably in my my paid client cases so so that was really, really um, a great experience. 
So what are some other examples of pro bono cases that have been particularly meaningful to you? Uh, sure. Um, recently, um, one that's been probably one of the most meaningful for me ever uh, was a family um, separation case, um, a woman uh, who had come from Honduras um, seeking um, asylum in the U.S. She had been um, separated from her son uh, at the border. And this was in the early stages. We were in the earlier people to take one of these cases on. And so um, working um, remotely, we were able to um, have her released on bond. At that point, we still had her they still had to be released on bond, so we helped her with the remote bond hearing. Um, and then working to try to locate her son, she didn't know she didn't know where he was, and and working to try to reunite them. Um, it was incredibly emotional. Um, definitely one of the most valuable experiences I think as a pro bono attorney I've ever had. Um, and um, one of those moments again where you really are reminded of why we do this work and the real human um, impact that this work can have. Um, and I know that there are so many people working in that area and so many people are doing it at such broader, larger scale, but that individual case was just um, incredibly emotionally impactful for me. And even just talking about it and thinking about it is a lot. Um, my son, um, I have an 11 year old son and he was close in age to the son of, of our client and, and to be able to see the pictures of the two of them together and to think about what they had gone through, you know, and their trek up here and then being separated after that and, and what, how he must've been feeling. And I know how she was feeling and, and knowing um, that they were able to, you know, come back together was, is, was powerful. Yeah, that's an inspiring and amazing story and case to work on. So what is on the horizon for the pro bono program? Do you have anything new in the works? Uh, well, I don't have anything new in the works at the moment. Um, I think at this point, I really want to look at, um, you know, a self-assessment um, from our, my attorneys and get an idea of where they want to see the firm continue. Um, I am, once again, sort of, interested in, in, in the community academic development work uh, in Detroit and thinking about more work we could do in that arena. Um, I'm also interested in doing more work with the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and while we have had partnerships um, in the past, I, I'd like to see more, um, what more we can do because I'd, I'd like to get more involved there. Um, we've, we've handled name changes, but, but that's been pretty much it. And I think there's more we can do. Um, I also would want to see, um, I'm just thinking it loud, but just thinking in terms of, um, the hate crime arena and trying to explore ways that we can somehow protect vulnerable communities in a way where we can be effective. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, some of that is education, um, some of that is outreach and, and depending on how we can figure out ways that we could take on, you know, individual cases. But uh, I'd like to see ways that we can train even clients on how to handle situations in a crisis, how to institute, you know, policies that would be, um, that minimize threats and um, protect the rights of those most vulnerable. Um, but I'm not really sure um, what that would look like exactly. But I do think that that's an area where we should be all thinking, given some of the rise that we're seeing and in, in, in really quite scary um, actions. Um, what can we do to uh, minimize that threat in a way that's, um, that can work with pro bono? So if you had a magic wand, what is one thing you would change about law firm pro bono or access to justice? I think if I had a magic wand for access to justice in particular, I do think it's these broader systemic um, portals, <laughs> I guess, changes in the, in the, the way that people can e enter the system. Um, I do think that you see some exciting changes happening in the self-help arena and in making processes more efficient. Um, but I think that that's an area that really needs to be developed more and more. There's no reason uncertain 
aspects of um, ways that we interface with the courts that it has to have this kind of monopoly on, on legal services coming from the law, like the legal community. I think that there needs to be easier mechanisms for basic needs to be met um, on a legal service side um, through self-help or through um, guided assistance that's not terribly time-consuming on the lawyer and that can really help those who, who need it most. I mean, obviously, you know, fines and fees are another area where you wouldn't want to see crippling fines and fees that really destroy someone's life. Um, and in ways that we could kind of streamline that and make it easier for those most in need that not to be saddled by the burden um, that they can never get out from under. Um, and I don't, I'd like to see that more and more. And that's not really from the law firm side. Um, that's really, you know, broader changes that need to be made. But I do think that that would have a big impact on access to justice generally. On the pro bono side, I think I'd like um, more and more, and I do think this is happening anyway, but more and more for attorneys to understand that um, pro bono is um, a gift. It's definitely not a burden. It's a gift. It's a gift that we have um, and a tool that we can use and a way that we can fulfill, um, again, those reasons for why we decided to become attorneys in the first place. Um, this is something that reminds us of why we're human and why we're here. <laughs> and people who take on pro bono do understand that. And the more and more we have people involved, I think that um, that will naturally occur. But that would be something that I'd, I'd want to see continue. So for my final question, who is your pro bono role model or access to justice role model and why? You can pick more than one because I know it's hard to pick between your favorite children. <laughs> That's true. Um, I would say, you know, honestly, Margot Schlager and Mary Mockerman, who were the two attorneys I mentioned working on the Mama case, um, seeing them in action has been awe-inspiring. I, I can't describe. Um, Margot has been really instrumental and in, again, pulling together all of the data and and figuring out the networks to be able to get pro bono, you know, um, deployment <laughs> across the country for all of these people in need and, and her creativity and looking at how to do that and managing the process and understanding the, the systems that would be able to make that happen on such a big scale. And I, and I think you can see her work being replicated in other, other cases that she's not a part of. I mean, I think she's been an inspiration for several other people. I mean, she also runs the, um, I think it's the Civil Rights Clearinghouse at University of Michigan, where you can just get, you know, any kind of pleading in any of these areas, like at easy access. And, and, and that's huge to understand what's going on um, in almost real time to see in all these cases that are so critical right now, what's happening and, and getting models and, and seeing what other people have done. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive. Um, and I don't, I, she does this while also, you know, working on briefs and, and, and arguing and, and teaching and, you know, being a mom and, you know, like she's, she's all this stuff going on as well. So that's really, really just been inspirational. Um, and, and she's brilliant. Um, and Miriam Ackerman um, over at the ACLU of Michigan, I really have never met someone like her before. Um, and I'm honored and privileged to have known her <laughs> um, because she's just a beautiful writer who really understands why we're doing this work and how to communicate it. And that's such an important skill because, you know, obviously lawyers, we, we write in a certain way, we think in a certain way. And she understands that telling the story in an effective and impactful way is, is so critical to being successful. And, and I think she does it so naturally because it's, it's just how she is to her core. Like she believes she, she, understands the work that we're doing in, in, in such a real and sincere and true and pure way that it comes out in her writing so beautifully. And, and I'm just always amazed at what she's able to produce. Um, and again, someone who is, is juggling so much. I mean, this is not her only case. She's juggling so many other cases and where she's, again, almost always successful. These huge, huge impact cases, um, as well as being a mom too. And so, so seeing the work that she does and, and seeing how beautifully she does it, 
and and how sincere and 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 just a good person she is has been um again it's been a gift so those would be my two pro bono heroes and inspirations are pro bono or, or access to justice heroes inspiration great well thank you wendy for joining me today i enjoyed our conversation oh thank you so much elise it's been wonderful to talk to you New and archive episodes of the podcast can be found on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Please take a moment to leave an Apple Podcast review. It's quick and easy to do. We'd appreciate the feedback and would help make it easier for other listeners to find the show and expand the conversation about pro bono and access to justice. We'd love to hear from you. Send your comments, feedback, and questions to pro bono at probonoinst.org.